We must now move on to questions to the Minister for Finance and Personnel. Questions number 3, 4 and 14 have been withdrawn, and I call Mr Pat Ramsey. Mr Ramsey. No discussions with the Minister for Social Development regarding the use of financial transactions capital for planned social housing. However, I am aware that there are a number of affordable housing projects exploring options to utilise financial transactions capital. Yeah, further to that, could I, could I ask the Minister to ensure that you know, there is a major crisis in social housing across Northern Ireland? And every member of this House would agree with me that we need much more and many more housing developments of a social development nature. Could I ask the Minister, would she ensure to have that conversation with the Minister of Social Development to see how the Department of Finance could help progress these capital monies to housing associations? Well, I think that the current funding model for uh, social housing uh, utilises an element of public grant funding, and that's to try and lever in additional uh, private finance. And um, even during the current uh, or the, the very recent past housing turmoil, there was no problem accessing private finance for social housing. Um, and if the social housing program uh, was to be fully funded through financial transactions capital, the rent that would be required to service the debt uh, in relation to FTC would actually make it unaffordable for most of the social housing tenants. Now, if there are some new ideas in relation to using um, FTC for social housing. I will, of course, uh, look at that. Um, um, but at the, at, at, as I said uh, in my substantive answer, we have been able to work with um, developers who are looking at uh, affordable homes and help them to uh, build new homes. And we've done that through a range of uh, Get, building, uh, Get Britain building, affordable home loans, empty home schemes. We've used FTC in, in that context. Uh, but if there's new and innovative ways to use it for social housing, I'm very, I stand ready to look at that as well. Mr. Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for responses. Can the Minister provide any details of, of any schemes under the control of her department uh, where financial transactions capital funding has been used within the past two years? Well, as I've just indicated, um, uh, we have used FDC funding uh, in a number of affordable home pilots. Uh, in 2012-13, uh, we allocated 11 million, well, nearly 12 million, to get Britain building. Uh, in 13-14, we again uh, granted uh, 7 mil 7.2 million. Uh, to get Britain building, also 5 million to affordable home loans and uh, 3.7 million to the empty home scheme. And in this financial year, uh, there was also money uh, passed to, the, to affordable home loans and empty home schemes in 14-15 and 15-16. Uh, 25 million has uh, been granted to the Northern Ireland co-ownership and that has freed up actually 15 million of conventional capital, uh, allowing it to be reallocated. So we think that that is uh, a good use of the financial transactions capital that we have access to. Call Mrs Judith Cochran for a question. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number two please. Consideration is given during the in-year monitoring process when determining whether it is necessary to apply reductions to departments' budgets to fund pressures in other areas. It will also form part of the deliberations in the upcoming budget exercise. Mrs Cochran for supplementary. Thank you. And I thank the Minister uh, for her answer. Does the Minister agree that it might help to bring um, some reality um, to some parties uh, if demands for expenditure to do one thing um, had to be balanced by requisite cuts um, to another rather than just, say, perhaps a top slice across departments um, or indeed um, actually having to consider increasing um, revenue? The argument and uh, discussion that we have every time we have a monitoring round, if people are making bids in terms of their departments, where does that money come from? Is it uh, around top slicing other departments or do we actually uh, reduce the allocation to another department? And thus far we've had those discussions and we've used the programme for government to inform those discussions obviously in and around our various priorities uh, in that programme for government. 
Uh, in the next programme for government, uh, we will very much be focusing on outcomes. What is the best use of our resources to give us the outcomes that we desire uh, for the people of Northern Ireland? And I hope that all of the parties will look to that outcome-based uh, process, because I think it will give us an even better outcome in the next programme for government round. Well, Mr. Adrian Cochrane Watson. Deputy Speaker, I uh, thank the Minister for answer. Bearing in mind, Minister, that the June and October monitoring rounds now likely not to be carried out until December. How can our departments be expected to balance their books, particularly in capital expenditure? Well, I did write to the departments on the 1st of June uh, of this year, indicating uh, that they should not be engaging in discretionary spend, that they should only be engaging uh, in inescapable spend, because I knew that we were going to uh, face difficulties, uh, and that was before, actually, we passed the Budget No. 2 Bill. Uh, so departments know uh, that they have to live within their means, otherwise we will breach our control totals, and that's certainly not a position that we want to be in uh, coming into the new year. But of course this is all going on in the context uh, of the talks, the fact that we have to have welfare reform sorted out, the fact that we need to have those flexibilities that were agreed in the Stormont House Agreement, and I can only hope that we get that sorted out in the very near future. Call Ms Clare Hanna for question. You question five, Mr Speaker. Information held by my department has been shared with the committee to support its fact-finding review. I call Ms. Anna for supplementary. Can the minister advise uh, what documents, if any, the NCA have requested from her department? Well, I can't uh, because they continue to meet with the department, uh, and I think it would be wrong if I. Uh, in, indulged uh, the member in terms of uh, what has been discussed with the NCA. It is a criminal investigation. I'm sure she respects that. Uh, we will have ongoing discussions with the National Crime Agency. Uh, but as I say, all of the information has now been forwarded to the committee uh, for their perusal, and I've no doubt that they will look through it and ask questions appropriately. Well, Mr. Jim Allister. Yeah, in three recent written replies, the minister advised me that no record had been kept of the ministerial meeting in March 2014 with Cerebus, that there were no records in the department of the alleged briefings of executive colleagues on the NAMA loan book, and that she was unable to give any information about departmental ministerial meetings with Ian Coulter, Frank Kirsten and Gareth Robinson, because it would be too difficult to collect the information. Why is there this culture of not keeping records? And is that so that the department can cover its tracks when it comes to NAMA? No, it is not. Does the minister believe that Sammy Wilson and Simon Hamilton should now follow her example and cooperate with the Finance Committee inquiry? They establish exactly what their dealings were uh, with PIMCO and Cerberus. Well, I'm unaware uh, as to whether they've been asked to attend the committee. I'm sure if they are asked to attend the committee, they'll consider that request uh, as to whether they should attend to help the committee in their investigation and whether they can be of use to the committee in their investigation. Uh, certainly, um, uh, if I, you know. It's up to them at the end of the day uh, whether they attend, but I'm not aware whether they have been asked to attend at this present moment in time. Mrs. Joanne Dobson for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number six. Uh, over 120 bids were received from across the public sector, with the total amount requested equating to approximately five times the value of the fund. Allocations were agreed by the executive as part of the budget 2015-16. The list of successful bids is published in the Executive's Budget 2015-16. All selected projects are received, have received funding and are at various stages of implementation. A mid-year update on progress has been sought, spend has been monitored in year, and evaluations will be completed in 1617, as per the Northern Ireland Guide to Expenditure Appraisal and Evaluation Guidance. Ms Dobson for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask, the, is the Minister satisfied then that the Fund will achieve what it was intended to do during the current financial year? Yes, I, mean, I, I was very encouraged uh, with the level of applications 
to the fund. Um, I do recall when I was in my previous role as Enterprise Minister uh, that we were able to draw down a significant amount of money uh, to actually deal with skills in relation to the workforce here. So I am hopeful that it will deliver on the aims and objectives that were set out uh, for the fund, which were, of course, to encourage innovation in the public sector, uh, to improve integration and collaboration between government departments, arm's length bodies, the private sector uh, and the third sector, uh, to support a decisive shift towards uh, preventative spending uh, with a focus on improving outcomes for citizens, uh, and to support transformational change required to sustain medium to long term uh, efficiency measures. So those are the aims uh, of the fund. And I am certainly hopeful that the money uh, that we are spending right across uh, the Northern Ireland Civil Service will help us to deliver on those aims. Well, Mr. Andy Allen for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question seven, please. Uh, the Department of the Environment was allocated £50 million financial transactions capital for the ARC 21 waste facility project by the Executive in its budget for 15-16. The member will, will be aware of the announcement by the Environment Minister on the 24th of September 15 to refuse planning permission for our 21 waste facility at Hightown Road. DOE has now formally confirmed that the £50 million financial transactions capital is now not required in 1516 and is being surrendered for the executive to reallocate. Mr Allen for supplementary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the Minister for her response. My party repeatedly argued that the money should not have been allocated in the first place. Does the Minister now agree that the £50 million allocation was premature, not least given the fact that the permission was always uncertain? Well, the money was uh, allocated after uh, a, a request uh, from the Department of the Environment. Uh, they are now indicating uh, that they do not uh, wish to use that financial transactions capital. Um, I accept and wholeheartedly agree with them um, that uh, announcing a reduced requirement of this scale so late in the financial year is disappointing. Uh, I think it is disappointing. However, there is no reason why it should be lost to Northern Ireland and the Executive will consider reallocating uh, the £50 million FTC along with any other financial issues facing the Northern Ireland Executive and the block grant uh, through the in-year monitoring progress, which I hope will happen after the talks are finished. Call Mr Dominic Bradley. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, is it not the case that the uh, amount of financial transaction capital which was available to Northern Ireland was oversubscribed? And does this uh, uh, 50 million now not enable those who didn't benefit from uh, it previously to benefit from it now? Well, uh, that's not the way it works. If it was oversubscribed last year, it doesn't just follow through uh, into this year. We have to make allocations uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, we will try and reallocate uh, this amount of money. As the member is probably aware, we are setting up uh, the Northern Ireland Investment Fund, and it may well be the case that we reallocate it to the Northern Ireland Investment Fund, um, and uh, we can move forward on that basis. Um, as I said, it is disappointing it is so late in the year, but we will try and do our best to make sure it is reallocated. Well, Ms. Mead McLaughlin for a question. Please. The Executive has not made any decisions regarding budgets beyond the 15 16 financial year. Uh, the Department for Regional Development has responsibility for the Smart Bus Pass scheme, and any issue regarding its future operation should be taken up with a DRD. Ms. McLaughlin for supplement. Gourmet, uh, and I thank the Minister for her answer. But can I ask, given the importance suppose, of this across the sector, particularly uh, amongst our elderly population, is it likely that we will see that this funding will be maintained longer term? Uh, well, certainly the concessionary fare scheme uh, remains an executive commitment, and uh, I think it would be a very foolish um, member of this assembly that uh, sought to do away with it, um, because it has brought tremendous benefits um, to the older population, and uh, I think it has proven very successful. So, um, in terms of uh, ring fencing and uh, moving forward, as she will know. Only frontline health and social care uh, were protected in the 15-16 uh, 
uh, budget and therefore it really is for the DRD Minister uh, to decide during this year, but I have no doubt that it will become a matter for discussion during the next programme for government discussions and I predict uh, quite confidently that we will continue to keep the Smart Pass scheme. Call Mr Samuel Gardner for a question. Speaker, question number nine. Departments have registered pressures in the June monitoring round of £234.6 million on Resource Dale and £327.1 million on Capital Dale. A recent high-level assessment by my officials indicates that over £100 million of these pressures are inescapable. In addition to departmental pressures, failure to implement welfare reform has put at risk the budgetary flexibilities negotiated in the Stormont House Agreement which included flexibility to pay, repay both the £100 million reserve claim in 1415 and the £114 million reduction to our budget for non-implementation of welfare reform from capital budgets. Call Mr Gardner for a supplement. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I do thank the Minister for her information. and She has even given me the reply that I would have been putting to her as a supplementary, so I do thank the Minister for that. Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister how uh, inescapable pressure is defined and how her department scrutinises uh, such bids from other departments? Well, as you can imagine, we have to go into quite some detail uh, with accounting officers to find out which bids are speculative as opposed to contractual. And it's really that element that we look at, whether uh, departments have, are contractually obliged to deliver on particular issues. And uh, after that exercise, as I've indicated, uh, we believe that the inescapable budgets, not the things that would be nice to do or good to do, but the inescapable piece is in and around £100 million. Mr Phil Flanagan for a question. There are no plans to publish monthly details of rate collection for both domestic and non-domestic customers. Well, Mr. Flanagan, for a supplementary. I thank the, the minister for her answer. She's really informed today in providing uh, informative and, and concise answers, uh, which is good to see, even though we don't always agree with the, the content of them. Can I ask the minister whether she agrees that the release of timely and accurate um, information would give the public a greater insight into the workings um, of the government and increase the confidence of businesses in LPS and how it works? I do, absolutely. And uh, as he will know, uh, LPS provides uh, on audited information to the DFP committee uh, at regular intervals throughout the year. Uh, they do um, uh, make every effort to support those who are struggling to pay, and we do recognise that there are a number of people who struggle to pay uh, their rates bills, uh, but they also must rigorously um, pursue those who don't pay as well, and that has to be taken into account. Uh, in terms of the collection rate against target for 1415, uh, a total of 1.175 billion was transferred to the Paymaster General. Uh, against the target of 1.165 million for 14-15, which was 37 million pounds more than 13-14. So last year uh, was a good year in terms of rates collection for Northern Ireland. The member will be aware that I have been encouraging concise questions as well as answers for years. I call Mr. Trevor Lund. Deputy Speaker, question 11, please. The Ministerial Advisory Council, the MAC, was uh, established in July 2014 and brings together an international expert advisory panel of practitioners, business people and academics to provide independent expert advice on public sector reform, improvement and innovation in Northern Ireland. The MAC has met on three occasions to consider and provide advice on a range of reform-related themes and initiatives, including the OECD review, staff reward and recognition, and outcome-based measures. The most recent MAC meeting involved members working alongside senior officials from all executive departments in a workshop format to explore the challenges and obstacles associated with addressing and implementing cross-cutting reform. The topic of ageing was used as a practical exemplar, and outputs from this work will help to inform future approaches to cross-cutting reform. Mr. Lund for supplementary. Yes, I thank the Minister for that answer. I'm, I'm sure the work of this, this body is, is very important and potentially fruitful, but it is a fact, I think, that it, it hasn't actually met since, since March. Is, is, is the Minister satisfied with that situation and satisfied with the general progress of the project? Well, I mean, I do very much um, 
welcome the work that the MAC are engaged on. Uh, the meeting, which was actually scheduled for the 17th of June, uh, was cancelled not by the group but by me because I was called to attend an urgent uh, meeting uh, at Her Majesty's Treasury in London. And, uh, then there was to be a second meeting on the 10th of September. Uh, and if I can remind, remind the member, that coincided with the commencement of uh, all party talks. So there have been, unfortunately, two dates that haven't been able to be completed on. And uh, I very much look forward to uh, chairing the next meeting of the Ministerial Advisory uh, Council on the 3rd of December, when we're going to focus on communication and public engagement. And I'm sure everybody in this House will want that meeting to take place. Call Mr. Danny Kennedy for a question. Twelve, please. On the 1st of April 2015 and the 30th of September 2015, the district valuers within Land and Property Services received 2,334 challenge type applications in relation to the revaluation of non domestic properties. This equates to some 3% of the total number of non domestic properties in Northern Ireland. Of the cases completed by the district valuers, 94 have proceeded to the next stage in the appeals process with an appeal to the Commissioner of Valuation. Well, Mr. Kennedy for supplementary. To the Minister for her, uh, her answer. The Minister uh, will be aware of, of concerns from uh, uh, a great many of, of my constituency, uh, uh, constituents in Newry and Armagh uh, who have concerns about not only the appeals process but the, the outcome of, of the uh, revaluation. Uh, could I ask the Minister, um, would she be prepared to meet uh, with me to discuss uh, uh, these issues? I am certainly uh, happy to meet with the member in relation to any specific issues he has. I uh, am a little bit concerned when he says he has concerns about the appeals process, which I had hoped uh, was pretty transparent. Um, however, if he has particular issues in around the appeals process, I am happy to speak to him. Uh, as he knows, uh, the revaluation was carried out uh, not to increase the amount of money raised, but to redistribute it on a, a modern rental evidence, because there had not been a revaluation for some 12 years, and we had been through the highs and lows uh, of the property boom uh, by that stage. So, happy to have that meeting, and look forward to discussing the issues with him. Mr. Raymond McCartney, for a question. <coughs> Question number three, Jig. Uh, question 13, please. My permanent secretary, David Sterling, provided oral evidence to the Finance Committee's fact-finding review into the sale of NAMA Northern Ireland loan portfolio on the 23rd of July 2015. Mr. Sterling is available to attend a, fur a further oral evidence session, should that be deemed necessary. Mr. McCartney, for supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answer? Because I think one of the, the the issues which surround the whole NAMA is this sort of idea of claim, counterclaim, uh, sometimes confusion, but sometimes evasion. And when the permanent secretary was in, he, he did say that he couldn't answer questions because of, of the possibility of a criminal investigation. Our people are saying that he could answer questions because some of the questions aren't related. So I think it's a good signal that he is coming back in because I think it's in the public interest that he's in and clears up any issues which he can clear up. Uh, and, uh, indeed, I indicated it to the committee just last week that he was prepared to come back, and uh, we await hearing from the committee as to when they wish him to come back. We have now exhausted questions to the minister, and we can move on uh, to topical questions. And I call Mrs. Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the minister if she has ever met with uh, Garth Robinson? Ian Coulter or Frank Cushnan in any of her ministerial roles, and if so, was NAMA ever discussed? Uh, well, to the last uh, part of her questions, no, NAMA was never discussed. Have I met with Gareth Robinson? Yes, I have. Have I met with Ian Coulter? It would be rather strange if I hadn't, because he was the chair of the CBI at the time when I was the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment. Have I met Frank Cushnan uh, in ministerial role? I don't believe so, but I have met him. Uh, but I don't believe I have met him as a minister. Mrs. Overend for supplement. Thank, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the minister. Um, can I ask the minister then if, at any stage, the idea of fixers' fees of millions of pounds was ever mentioned? 
I am tempted to say, unfortunately not, but that may be construed wrongly, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. So, no, at no time were fixers' fees mentioned uh, to me. As the member will realise, uh, I was the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment up to May of this year, and at no time were those matters discussed with me. Mr Patsy McGlone for a topical question. Uh, Graham, I've got to ask you on the We have a I recommend. Thanks very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister too. Um, could the Minister provide us with some detail, and I know some level of research has been carried out around the issue of enterprise zones, and uh, that a scoping exercise has been carried, I don't know whether it's by our own officials or some other departmental officials, but can she advise at what level of advancement the negotiations are proceeding with the Westminster Government and the Treasury? Around that matter, please. Well, as the member knows, uh, as chair of the Enterprise Committee, uh, we were granted uh, the prospect of having an enterprise zone, and the, the Coleraine was the one that was uh, put forward. Uh, the letter from the First and Deputy First Minister has now been sent to Her Majesty's Treasurer to request that that is uh, allocated uh, as an enterprise zone. On the wider issue of further work in terms of enterprise zones and other matters, indeed, uh, because I know some of his colleagues have been raising issues in and around city deals, for example, uh, and other issues, we are looking at all of those issues in the round to see what is the best fit for Northern Ireland in terms of particularly regional disparity. Are there some other ways in which we can deal with those issues which are suited to Northern Ireland? For supplement. I, I thank the Minister for her response. Um, does the Minister at this stage have any kind of time scale or time frame around that when those areas, once being identified, might be advanced to the next stage of, of the level of body of work that is required around that, just in the same way as Coleraine has been done? Well, of course, we have to, first of all, it's a pilot, so we have to see how coal rain works, uh, and so we have to give that uh, a bit of time. But that shouldn't stop uh, both my own department and the Department for Enterprise, Trade and Investment engage, and social development as well, actually. We ha I had a very useful meeting uh, with both of those ministers in the summer uh, in and around how we could develop further the concepts that were there, how we could make the best fit for Northern Ireland as opposed to just copying what was happening on the mainland. So I think it is important that we do what's right for Northern Ireland. Uh, is it at, a, at a, an advanced stage? No, it's not. Uh, but I think uh, we do have to wait and see how the pilot works in Coleraine first. Mr. Sean Rogers for a topical question. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Minister, I noticed the developments with e-tenders NI. What steps are being taken to ensure that all SMEs have access to suitable broadband and to ensure they can do their tenders online? Actually, uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question after Mr. McGlone's question because one of the uh, elements that we're looking at. Uh, for regional uh, disparity is to make sure that everyone has access to good, to good power supply, so to make sure that they have the level of electricity supply that they need, that there's good physical infrastructure in place, but also uh, that there's good broadband infrastructure in place. And he will be aware uh, that there have been many interventions uh, from DETI to try and help businesses and indeed homeowners uh, to access broadband infrastructure. And indeed, I was just speaking uh, to a business in my own constituency over the weekend around the use of the super-connected city vouchers, which allow you to access, uh, I think it's up to £3,000, uh, to connect into the broadband. So it's important that we all make our constituents aware of the different schemes that are out there to allow them to become connected, and then they can avail of all of the services which are going online. Mr. Rogers, for something. Could I thank you for that, Minister, and also acknowledge the work you've done in terms of getting broadband out there to rural areas. But as you know, in your constituents as well as mine, there are certain areas that are miles from that green box or the possibility of that green box. Is there any possibility of grants so that those people maybe could have satellite broadband to ensure they, they can get onto this um, e-tenders as well? Well, really, that's what the super-connected city vouchers are about. That, that started as just a scheme for Belfast, and then it was rolled out to Londonderry, and now it, now it applies to the whole of Northern Ireland. And with that voucher, you can access 
Um, it's technology neutral, if I can put it that way. You can access different types of technology, so whether it's satellite or line of sight or fixed line, uh, that allows you to apply and then to uh, have that. And it actually empowers the businesses uh, to engage in some negotiating uh, with the private sector uh, providers to allow them to get the best deal possible. So I do think it is working. Uh, I'm told that Fermanagh and OMA is second only to Belfast in terms of uh, uh, the take-up for super-connected vouchers. So I think that's very encouraging that such a rural area has been able to have that uptake. Ronan McGappen for a topical question. Can, can I ask the, the Minister what contingency planning her department has made in the event of a Brexit? Well, we haven't made uh, any contingency planning for that because we have uh, our own difficulties to deal with. And whilst uh, others might want to talk about European exit, what we certainly don't want to talk about is devolution exit. Uh, and that's the problem that uh, faces us at present, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. So we need to concentrate on our own particular financial difficulties to sort out welfare, to sort out the rest of the Stormont House flexibilities so that we can move forward. For supplementary. Uh, and I thank the Minister for her response. Do, does the Minister agree with me that a Brexit will destabilise our economy and undermine efforts over the past 20 years to uh, market this region to foreign investors as a gateway to Europe? No, I don't uh, agree with that assessment. I think that a lot of our companies ha are feeling very downtrodden in relation to the amount of regulation that they have to face on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, I was very alarmed when I met recently uh, with uh, a delegation from NERTA uh, to listen to the amount of form filling that goes in in a, a small business, just a small business with a couple of employees. They have to actually allocate one employee to fill out the forms for that business. And it's absolutely disproportionate and I think it's something that we need to tackle and I hope that we can tackle it through the red tape review but also to have a fuller discussion in relation to the European uh, legislation that does really have uh, an impact on our local businesses here. To Phil Flanagan for a topical question. Mr. Can I ask the Minister whether she accepts comments made by her predecessor, uh, Simon Hamilton, when he talked about poor budget uh, management within the Department of Health? Um, and can she outline what subsequent changes have been made in conjunction with the Department of Health um, to deal with that issue? Well, I think we all uh, accept that there are growing pressures in relation to the Department of Health that are not all related uh, to budget. There are, as he is aware, I'm sure. Um, Demographic, demographic pressures in relation to the Department of Health. And I have to say I was struck uh, by the fact that NISRA, in some of their statistics that they very recently brought out, uh, was able to tell me that we would grow to 1.9 million as a country by 2020, uh, but the 50% uh, of that growth would be uh, with older people. So that brings with it particular pressures for the Department of Health. Uh, and we have to deal with that. And how do we deal with it? I believe we deal with it in doing things differently. And I hope that we can have, uh, on the other side of the talks, those conversations around doing things differently. Because if you do keep doing things in the same way, then you're going to get uh, the same results. So therefore, we have to innovate in the health se uh, sector. And I know that's something that the Minister for Health is really very committed to. Mr Flanagan, for supplement. I suppose the, the Minister didn't really answer the question on that, on that occasion, um, but can she give me an indication as to whether um, she now accepts that her party has, has no credibility um, amongst the community now, given the, the way their ministers are coming in and out of office, um, like Lanigan's ball, um, and not dealing with scandalous uh, waiting lists um, and, and other pertinent issues. So she can tell me how her party uh, is going to try and deal with that uh, crisis within the health service without having a full-time Minister of Health in office. I'm certainly not going to take lessons about credibility from the member from Fermanagh and South Tyrone who has posed that question. Uh, I have to say, coming particularly from him, it's almost laughable. Um, can I say this? The, uh, the party opposite have engaged uh, in putting their heads in the sand for almost two years now in relation to welfare reform. And yet, we all know in this House and outside actually as well, don't be under any illusion, don't be trying to distract from the fact that because of the fact that you have not grasped the reality of the budgetary situation here in Northern Ireland, that we're losing £10 million every single month from the budget. Now, £10 million 
would be able to do quite a lot in the health service, Mr Deputy Speaker. I think it would bring us over 2,000 hip replacements and uh, it would deal with uh, even more knee replacements. So I am not taking lectures from the member in relation to credibility and certainly not in relation to financial management. Uh, order, please. Up until now, members have been extremely good and have not been shouting from sedentary positions. One member has just joined us and he's doing it, and I'd ask him not to do it again. I call Ms. Maeve McLaughlin. Can I ask the Minister to clarify how many NAMA related meetings relating to her department were not monitored? Well, the member can't expect me to have those figures in front of me. If she wants me to provide that information, I'm quite happy to write to the member. Ms. McLaughlin for a supplementary. Gourmel, good and I look forward to that detail from, from the Minister. But can I ask then, does the Minister believe that it is in effect highly inappropriate and questionable that both Sammy Wilson and Simon Hamilton were having on minuted meetings and carrying out actions relating to NAMA under the radar of the department in which they had? No, I don't accept that uh, at all. And uh, we look forward to the evidence of the First Minister tomorrow at the Committee for Finance and Personnel. I call Mr Samuel Gardner. Uh, may I ask the Minister for an update on the number of rate relief schemes which are available to the both domestic and non-domestic sectors? Well, as the member will be aware, uh, there's a wide range of rate relief schemes available uh, to uh, both sectors and indeed uh, the department uh, at the time of local government reform uh, put in place a rate convergence system which cost uh, 30 million pounds to help ease the burden of change that was coming to some of the rate payers. We do of course have the small business uh, rates relief scheme which has been hugely successful right across Northern Ireland. We have the empty property relief scheme uh, and of course industrial derating as well uh, which has been very helpful to our manufacturing sector. Mr Gardner for a supplementary. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister also for her response, but does the Minister intend to extend all these schemes into the next financial year? Well, the current financial year, yes, we will be keeping those schemes. We are looking at the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme, which was meant to be a, a short-term uh, intervention. We did roll it forward into this year again. We're looking uh, with the Department of Social Development as to whether that is the best use uh, of that money or would it be better to use it in a different way. So those are discussions that we will have, but we're not just going to end it very suddenly. It's something that we will do in consultation uh, with the small business uh, community because, as I say, that has been hugely beneficial to that community. Members, that concludes uh, question time. I should have said that question seven, uh, John McAllister was withdrawn. Question eight, Alex Maskey was withdrawn. And question 10, Misha, myself, was also withdrawn. <laughs>